thank you. So I'm Mark Mimon, and I work at the Messenger Propulsion Lab. And I want to talk a little bit about the evolution over time of some of the capabilities we've had on the Mars rovers that we've landed um, <coughs> from that NASA space program. So here's a kind of portrait of some of the engineering models that the spacecraft have sent. I don't know if you can see here. So we have the Sojourner rover, which landed some 20 years ago. That was the first successful Mars rover to land there and actually uh, use mobility on the surface. And that actually did demonstrate some autonomy, um, autonomous capability. I'll talk about it a little bit. And then seven years after that, we had the Spirit and Opportunity rovers, the Mars Exploration rovers. So we went from sort of a microwave oven size to golf cart size. And currently on Mars, we have the um, Curiosity Mars rover. And so that's, that's a little bit bigger. It's not quite an SUV, but it's, it's getting up there. Um, and the plan is for NASA, NASA's currently working on another generation of Mars rover to be launched in 2020. Uh, that will be about the same form factor as Curiosity, but it's still being designed and developed right now. So what do we like to do with Mars rovers when we get there? Well, we'd like to explore. Uh, we bring science instruments that can work both remotely, with its cameras or remote lasers or remote spectrometers, and also in situ measurements that are done by placing an arm or instruments on the arm onto targets. And for the earlier missions, uh, Spirit Opportunity, the uh, high slope environments were the most scientifically interesting ones. <laughs> when you get onto the slope, you don't have to drill down to see what history looked like, you just look right in front of you. You've got millions of years of history right, right in front of you. So even though we'd only designed the spacecraft to work at up to 15 degree slopes, the science team was like, we want to get on higher slopes. How high can we go? How high can we go? And we, we got up to about 30 degree slopes with Spirit and Opportunity on the, the different missions. <clears throat> so we also like to explore craters, we explore surfaces there, and fire mountains. These are all uh, special images rendered of, of actual Mars terrain with the, the CGI model there. Uh, Spirit uncovered some buried treasure once the wheel got, got stuck. The, uh, the right front wheel on Spirit stopped driving after a few years. And so it became an anchor that we're driving around. It wasn't free wheeling once it stopped working, it actually locked in place. And although that was pretty hard on the rover drivers to figure out how to maneuver the thing, it was always an eight degree yaw off of what you'd expect. Uh, by accident, they uncovered this buried treasure. It's like, it turned out to be one of the most scientifically interesting parts of the mission. So scientists were happy that the wheels had broken. Um, we also like to overcome obstacles. Seen here is a, a meter tall sand dune. Uh, opportunity got stuck in a much smaller sand dune, so we were a little bit nervous about planning this initial, initial drive in curiosity, but uh, thankfully it worked out well. I got to drive the upside and the downside of this drive, and I was very happy that we didn't get stuck either way. And a nice clean track so you can see. Here. And we've been exploring all kinds of novel terrain, including uh, the Bagnol Dunes in curiosity. This is a whole area just covered, covered in, in sand dunes. And uh, it's a little unnerving to see the height of a wall on this, the southern edge of this, this border. But uh, just to give you a, an idea of what the rover looks like in place, here's, here's a selfie we took with the bagel dunes on the uh, So just to give you an idea of how much exploring we've done, the, uh, I'll just summarize the, the the mission so far. So Sojourner 20 years ago landed, we promised it would work for a week on Mars. It lasted for three months. And in three months' time, the first mobile vehicle on Mars drove a total distance of 0.1 kilometers. Doesn't sound like much, but when you're moving at you know, a millimeter per second, it's pretty good over, over time. So seven years later, Spirit, in the next six years, drove 7.7 .7 kilometers. We landed we, we promised NASA and the world we could be able to drive almost a kilometer. And we went more than that, we got to the hills, the Columbia Hills, where we made that big, the big discovery. Uh, as of last year, the Opportunity rover had driven 40 kilometers <coughs> over 12 years. And you know, when, when we first landed here, it was, uh, it was a case of, uh, wow, we're in a crater. That's really great. Let's take a look at the crater. And there's one that's far away. We think we can get to it. We're talking about this one. And that was about you know, a few hundred, few hundred meters away. 
And once we spent half a year exploring there, we're like, well, where can we go next? If everything else is too far, we'll never get there. So we thought we'd set a real high goal for ourselves and go to the next year. It took a year to get there, but we made it. And we keep, get, we keep reaching our goals and exceeding them and moving on to the next bigger thing. So this is where we are. This is where we were a year ago and we're still on the edge of this crater right now. But we've gone over 45 kilometers so far. An opportunity grow with the land in 2004 is still driving today. It's still driving right now. And so the Curiosity rover, which landed four years ago, you might have seen the uh, fancy video of some of the air, how uh, autonomously arrived at the surface of Mars. Uh, well, we, we arrived and we explored a very small region for the first um, for the first year. We only went this far because the scientists were so excited by what they found. They found the convergence of three different geologic units with different explanations of the history of the region, some being embedded in water. Um, so they didn't want to go anywhere. But finally, once they explored that enough, we decided we uh, kicked it into higher gear and we started driving all the way down to um, toward Mount Sharp, and that, that's where we are now. We're driving toward really tall mountain in the center of this crater, which is huge. It, it's over 100 kilometers wide. So that's the context for the Mars rovers. We're a mobile platform, and we want to move from different places so we can do scientific studies of the, the geology, the, the history there, and be able to apply the uh, science instruments that we have. <clears throat> but we're limited in how we can command it. Um, part of my job right now is part of the Mars rover operations. So I'm one of the rover drivers. And the problem with commanding the rover on Mars is that we only get to talk to it once a day. So we might get data a couple times a day, but really we only get a chance to send commands to the robot one time a day. So the way that it works is you get up in the morning, you go to work, plan your activities out with the science team. The scientists choose what to do, and the engineers choose how to do it. And the whole team collaborates over the course of the day, coming up with a plan, implementing it, testing it, verifying it, simulating it, and finally uplinking it. So we really only get to talk one time a day. So that's a level of autonomy we have to support. <coughs> a spacecraft that's operating, a robot that's operating, with no human in the loop for 24 or more hours at a time. So um, people like to say the limit there is the, the speed of light because it takes anywhere from 2 to 42 minutes just to send a radio signal to Mars. And that, that is true, that is a hard limit. But there's also the limit of just logistics because the antennas we use to talk to the rovers are the Deep Space Network, and those antennas are shared on dozens of Deep Space missions. So we don't get to use them dedicated just to ourselves, we have to share it. So that, that's why we have this limitation we only get to talk once a day. So I won't be able to cover everything here, but I thought I'd just bring up a list of some of the, some of the uh, robotic autonomy that we have on, on the rovers. And I'm not going to be able to discuss all the other forms of autonomy, like the uh, autonomous operations for uh, entry descent landing, the anomaly response, or the fault response, being able to handle any problems that come up autonomously. Uh, but I'll, I'll talk about some of the robotic autonomy capabilities that we have. So as a human driver, every day you're driving the rover, you get to choose how do you want to implement the drive we're going to send it on. You can choose how much autonomy you want to turn on. And unfortunately on Mars, autonomy isn't free. On Earth, we might run things at visual odometry at 20 hertz, right? Many times a second, you get an update of where you are. On Mars, it, it runs at something like 0.02 hertz. So it takes a lot, a lot of time, it, it, more processing time to get things done. So you have to make a choice. Um, and human drivers can choose between using visual odometry to use <coughs> images to measure your 3D position and orientation, also autonomous navigation to measure the geometric shape of the terrain and decide what's an obstacle and isn't, how to get around it. You can also track targets along the way to reduce the uncertainty of getting closer to a faraway target. You know, when you, when you take data in stereo, you, you measure the distance in stereo, there's some uncertainty there. But the closer you get, the less the uncertainty is, so you can be more sure you're getting to your target. And if we choose, we can even choose to drive just directly without using all the autonomy sensing on board, which is faster, but obviously doesn't have the extra safety features. So I'm going to give some examples of some of these different capabilities. Here are some images from Curiosity, Curiosity mission, and this is showing our visual odometry capability. And the way this works is by looking at the terrain, we take stereo pairs before and after a small drive step about a meter. And we look at the terrain and we say, where are we now? Did we get to where we thought we were going? Or did we slip along the way? We autonomously measure dozens of features, track their position, and we get a full 60 degree freedom to pose that out. Um, and in terrains where it's too sandy, and we don't have features, we can look at our tracks. 
So why do we need VO? Because when we're driving, there's no sensor on board that can actually measure translation of slip. Just like your phones, we have an IMU. We have Excels and gyros that can measure attitude changes, but nothing that can measure just the sideway change. You can doubly integrate Excels, but they're too noisy. Um, so we have to rely on the vision system. And this terrain is an example of why. We once spent two weeks just trying to get around the pile of rocks and the distance there on a high slope. This is at about a 17 to 22 degree slope here. Another benefit of visual geometry is that in a complex, complex terrain, like when you're slipping and sliding in an uncertain way, you can actually achieve your goal, get to where you're going autonomously more quickly. You don't have to have humans in the loop to say, oh, I wish we could have stopped here and maneuvered here. You just tell it to go where it's going, that will measure its progress and automatically correct the path to the goal. That's something that on Earth we can do much more cheaply, but on Mars we have to you know, make active choices to enable that. So also on board we're running dead stereo. Um, and you know, nowadays we have, you can buy Connect, you can buy other sensors where you can get a dead stare coming out, but uh, we were starting this back in um, 2003 on the Mars Exploration Rovers. And dead stereo feeds into our terrain assist, our understanding of where obstacles are. As the rover drives, when it's stable, we can take the pictures and build up a map. The red means don't go there, the yellow and green means it's okay, and very, very slow as of preference. And if you'd like more information on how it does the mapping from um, the scarier data into the train assessment, you can watch, uh, just search for Rover Navigation 101 online. That'll, that'll be a video that explains it for ER. It's a similar approach for MSL. For Curiosity, we have more images to do for Curiosity. That's the same basic strategy. And here's an example of that process at work. Let's see if I can scary here. So this was one of the first checkout days of using the autonomous driving on Curiosity. It's an image taken after the fact and the telemetry played over the top of that. You can see as we drive, we stop and collect multiple images along the way. So we can get a good idea of what the terrain is ahead of us, far enough ahead of us to see more than a rover footprint ahead. And during this checkout, it decided that everything's so nice, it's going to avoid even these small rocks, even though they weren't truly unbelievable. It said, well, these aren't that great, but it will be easier if I go over this one, so it chose to go that way. Uh, thankfully, we get to tune parameters after the fact, so we were able to adjust it to the train here. We obviously we never had this train to test with, so a couple days later, it wasn't so afraid of these time rocks. But some other examples of the autonomous driving, this is Spirit, avoiding, avoiding a rock in its path, avoiding a rock pile in a ditch off to the right here. And so, we added, in, on the, in the uh, Mars Exploration Rover mission, the Spirit and Opportunity Rovers, we started without a global planner. We just had a local planner on board that was using a greedy algorithm, and if something got away, it may not be able to make it to the goal. So we added a global planner, and this shows how the global planner works in the lab. It's an algorithm from Carnegie Mellon University called the D-Star. It's like a dynamic version of the A-Star search algorithm. Um, and so we, we tested it, we developed it on Earth, and it looked good, it could build up maps and make decisions. And so we were able to uplink it on the ER as a demo. So we demonstrated a new technology that had not been on the rovers of the planet, set new software, and we were able to show it working on Mars. And we did the demo on, on the ER, and that became the baseline for the next generation of Curiosity. So every autonomous trial Curiosity has taken has been with this global path planner capability. So it was first demonstrated on the early mission. Here's some examples of some of the Tests we've done the visual target tracking. Um, this is a mode that's available to rover drivers in case they want to be able to specify a target and get close enough to it by imaging as we go. I'm running out of time here, so I'm just going to give a few quick overview. Um, so we have the capability also of doing autonomous science. Um, the, the Aegis software was developed after we landed and uplinked, and it was used by the science team to reduce the amount of data that comes down and also to find targets. Uh, autonomously after after a drive. They specify some characteristic about the, the, the ground they want to see. Uh, Aegis focuses on it and sets a target for the instrument to image. We've also demonstrated the ability on the ER to um, do autonomous instrument. So you drive to a new location you've never been at before, you open up, take out your arm and you place the um, sensors on the ground directly. Unfortunately on the MER system that took us such a long time to process, it didn't get used that much. 
And, and the curiosity rover is now it's not such a big arm. The arm on curiosity weighs as much as the whole Spirit of Opportunity rover did. Uh, we've decided not to use that capability on, on this mission, but it's still a technology that's available for future use. And just to give an idea of how often autonomy is used, as opposed to the sort of direct style of driving, it's going to just go here, go here, go here. Um, here's a breakdown of opportunities first year. The different colors on the tracks here show you what modes were used. So red means humans looked at the images themselves and said it's perfectly safe, just drive, don't look. But the green was places where they asked the rover to make the choice. So it would look at the terrain, build up its map, and make choices about where to drive. You can see we alternate. We drive a little bit in the blind and then continue to extend the drive as we had power and time available using autonomy to get it even farther. Same thing for Spirit. Spirit alternated the drives at shorter distances on Spirit because it was much rockier in its terrain. And then on Curiosity, here's a plot of um, how far we drive every day and what mode. And I just want to point out that if I look at the same data, I sort of a cumulative plot here. What's interesting is that Sojourner drove very little with autonomy. MER used some autonomy, but it was probably less than about a quarter of the overall drive. Whereas on Curiosity, the, the red here is the directly driving, pure direct with no autonomy. What? Everything above the red has some amount of autonomy in it. So I think it's great that over the course of these three missions, NASA has really improved and increased the amount of autonomy that's being used on the spacecraft during operations. And you can see what a challenge it is to do that. It's a summary of the computing that we have available here. Um, Sojourner's processor is 2 megahertz. And ER is for an opportunity for 20. And Curiosity is a bit higher. In 2020, the next rover will have a comparable processor, but a little more stuff as well. Um, I'm almost out of time, so I'll skip over these other summary slides. But just point out that for the 2020 mission, we're also adding an FPGA co-processor to give us more computing capability on board to do this sort of train out understanding visual geometry. So we'll be able to have the autonomy on even more than we did for, for uh, Curiosity. So, looking forward to continuing Curiosity operations. Uh, I just got calls and emails today when I'm getting ready for my talk here outside. I had to respond to some questions, but we're really looking forward to exploring more of Mount Shark in the years to come. So, thanks very much. <laughs>